أسعد الله صباحكم في هذه الجلسة الثانية لهذا اليوم. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, to the second session of this morning, which will be also the policies of the United States towards the storming, sweeping changes. Uh, especially what happened in Tunisia and Egypt. We'll have uh, Dr. Michel Dunn on the U.S. response to revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia. Then we will have uh, another presentation on the U.S. policy towards the Muslim Brotherhood and also the position uh, of the revolutionary masses and the youth who started these revolutions. The first speaker will be Michelle Dunn from Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She obtained her PhD from Georgetown and she used to teach there. She also worked at the White House as a Middle East specialist and uh, relations with the two countries she will be presenting on, and these are Egypt and Tunisia. Thank you, Dr. Saud, and uh, thank you to the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies for this enjoyable session. I will be switching into English so that I can express my thoughts more precisely and also because... So uh, I will speak about um, U.S. policy toward Tunisia and Egypt. And uh, I, I will give you my main point right at the beginning. My main point is this that um, the, the legacy or the background of U.S. relations with these two countries has had a profound effect on how the United States was able to deal with the changes, the very uh, cataclysmic changes that took place in Tunisia and Egypt over the last few years. As a result of this, in the current period now, we see the U.S. relationship with Tunisia beginning to blossom and improve. And we see the U.S. relationship with Egypt uh, withering a bit. It's far from dead, uh, and I think it will continue. But it is troubled. it's a troubled relationship. Now, the difference between where the United States is uh, in its relationships with these two countries is partly due to the different trajectory of these transitions in Tunisia versus Egypt. Uh, obviously, the transition in Tunisia after the removal of Ben Ali, while it has, been, it has not been perfect and it is not completely safe even now, it has, it has been more peaceful and in many ways, I think, more successful than what has happened in Egypt over the last few years. It's also true that the, the, the size and the weight of U.S. interests regarding the two countries is quite different. Uh, and what is at stake for the United States regarding Tunisia versus Egypt is very different. But I, I want to make the argument that that isn't uh, the only thing, that it is the legacy of the relationship itself, the pre-2011 relationship with Egypt that has proved a very heavy legacy uh, to, to overcome. And it's been a real obstacle in the United States formulating uh, or even adapting its policy toward Egypt in the current period. Uh, David Pollack said during the last pattern that U.S. policy often reacts to developments. It's more reactive than proactive, and I think this is true. But it's also true that uh, we get into patterns 
uh, in U.S. relationships that are sometimes very difficult to break. So I'll begin with Tunisia. Before 2011, of course, the United States' relationship with Tunisia was quite a small one. We all know that Tunisia's relations with Europe and especially France were much more consequential than the relations with the United States. Um, I will express this in terms of the amount of U.S. assistance given. Of course, that's not the only indicator, but it, but it gives you an idea. So uh, in 2010, in the year before the uprising in Tunisia, the United States gave Tunisia $15 million in security assistance and just $2 million in economic assistance. Tunisia had long been uh, an enthusiastic participant in U.S. military training, and in fact, Tunisia was largely dependent on the United States for most of the military equipment that it bought and so forth, but of course, it's a very small, modest military in Tunisia. There was, of course, uh, counterterrorism cooperation between the two countries. But, as I said, the United States was not Tunisia's major ally on the outside. And this was very clear from a number of actions that Tunisia took. For example, there had been discussion about a free trade agreement between the United States and Tunisia, uh, and the United States has one with Morocco, but uh, Tunisia really did not, did not pursue this with much interest. Uh, there was a sense, and we can see this now in the WikiLeak, WikiLeaks cables that we can read from, for example, by uh, the United States ambassador in Tunisia and so forth, writing about the relationship, that Tunisia in many cases was, would be concerned about annoying or alienating France by getting too close to the United States and so forth. Uh, also, Tunisia, in terms of security cooperation, rejected hosting a base for the new United States Africa Command, AFRICOM. So uh, the relationship with Tunisia was limited, and it was also limited by uh, the nature of the Ben Ali um, government. We see again from US WikiLeaks cables that the United States was quite aware of the corruption and so forth in Tunisia, and this led to a, a kind of a coolness, right? Ben Ali was not treated as a, a leader who was very close to the United States. Now, uh, after the revolution, of course, the United States was, as everyone, quite, quite surprised by what was going on. I think they, they, they didn't expect the uprising and they didn't expect Ben Ali to fall uh, as quickly as he did. Um, and uh, the United States, uh, approached it with some caution. I mean, there were some statements that were welcoming of the changes in Tunisia, and as I said, Ben Ali had not been a particularly close ally. Uh, but in terms of U.S. assistance, the United States proceeded with caution. Uh, and, um, uh, and as you know, there was also a crisis in, relationship, in the relationship in September 2012 when there was this uh, attack by... Uh, on, on the American embassy and on the American school there following this uh, very controversial video uh, that uh, in the United States that was insulting to Islam and so forth. So uh, there was a crisis in the relationship, but after that, and particularly throughout 2013, and as we saw uh, Tunisians beginning to reach more of a consensus and after passing their uh, constitution and so forth. Tunisia has been welcomed uh, in the United States with uh, increasing warmth, right? And we have seen a big increase in U.S. assistance, right? I mentioned, you know, in in 2010 we were looking at a total of 17 million dollars in economic uh, in uh, economic and military aid to Tunisia from the United States. Over the three years ensuing from 2011 to 2014, in three years there was a total of uh, $300 million in uh, economic assistance and $100 million in military assistance, in addition to that a $500 million loan guarantee, et cetera. Now, m this is often criticized as inadequate that the United States hasn't done enough to support the Tunisian transition, and that may be the case. I'm not, ca not making the case that it is all it should be. However, it is a great deal more than it than it was. Okay, so what we see is this is a this is a burgeoning relationship that Tunisian Prime Minister and other Tunisian leaders were just in Washington weeks ago and really greeted as heroes and celebrated and so forth. So, and this is all I, I think the United States was able to 
make these changes, partly because the relationship with Tunisia before the revolutions was small. There was, there was a very small base from which to grow, okay, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, on the, uh, by contrast, the relationship with Egypt, of course, was a very long-standing and complicated relationship. Uh, my uh, colleague Mohammed Menchawi in the last panel did an excellent job, I think, at uh, discussing the relationship in detail. And so I will not go through everything uh, in this relationship. I will not repeat what he said. But suffice it to say that between 1979 and 2010, the United States had invested uh, $39 billion in military aid, $27 billion in economic aid. This was a very big relationship, right? Uh, and, uh, but it was, in some ways, also had become a very dysfunctional relationship uh, for several reasons. Mohammed mentioned already the triangulation in the relationship between, it wasn't just a relationship between Egypt and the United States, it was Egypt and Israel and the United States. And uh, uh, one could write volumes on, on all the implications of that, but it, it made the relationship very complicated. Uh, and it still continues to complicate the relationship now. Um, the other uh, issue, another issue, of course, was there, there was increasing disagreement, I would say, between the United States and Egypt over internal affairs, whether economic, political, human rights, during the Mubarak period, right? Uh, now, uh, it, um, this did not lead to a break in the relationship, but it led to tension in the relationship, and we know particularly during the Bush period, although there had been more common ground on economic issues over the last, uh, the last seven or eight years of Mubarak's presidency. Uh, the third, but the other issue I wanna bring out is this. Another thing that I think was dysfunctional about the relationship, and is still dysfunctional now, is the imbalance between uh, the military and the economic or civilian side of the relationship. When the relationship first started in the late 70s uh, and in, through the early 80s, there was actually a kind of a balance. It was roughly $1 billion each in economic assistance. Uh, economic assistance and military assistance were roughly the same. After a few years, uh, the military assistance became a little higher and became 1.3 billion, which it has been up to this day. And the economic assistance settled in at about 800 million. Uh, but, and it stayed in that pattern for a long time. Then, in the last 15 years, since about 1998, economic assistance started to decline and decline. And there were reasons for this we can discuss if you are interested. I don't want to take the time now. But what happened is the, the military assistance stayed at $1.3 billion and the economic assistance came down to $250 million. So we see a very, very big difference. And that led to a very, very big difference in terms of the kind of U.S. engagement with the country. Uh, it, it became, uh, there was less and less people-to-people -people engagement, less and less of this kind of thing, and yet the military, the engagement with the military stayed the same. Uh, this is at a time, by the way, when, when what we were seeing in Egypt was, in a way, I'm still talking about the Mubarak period, the last 10 years of the Mubarak period, that in a way, the opposite was happening. In other words, the Egyptian government and the state was becoming very stagnant, and Egyptian society, on the other hand, was becoming more and more dynamic, and more and more the driver of change. So uh, my argument is this led to a kind of imbalance in the relationship and one that is very troublesome now, I think. Now, uh, uh, we all know the story of, you know, what, what happened, how, how the United States, uh, uh, President Obama decided roughly a week into the Egyptian uprising to, to support the Egyptian people. Uh, rather than Mubarak, and by the way, of course, this 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 was made much easier by the fact that that's where the Egyptian military was also going, and I I, I do not believe that the United States persuaded the Egyptian military to support the people. I think the Egyptian military did it for its own very good reasons, uh, and therefore it was it was not a difficult decision for 
for the United States to make, right? So, uh, to, uh, because the military was going that way in any case, right? So the United States went that way, and there, there was an attempt um, in the first couple of years uh, after the Egyptian Revolution to support a growing democracy and so forth. Uh, and, and we know these, these efforts ran into a great, deal of, uh, a great deal of trouble. There was an attempt to increase economic assistance. President Obama offered a $1 billion debt relief that would have been $330 million a year for Egypt in debt relief that would have been, in effect, economic assistance to the Egyptian government. Um, and this failed because of some bad relations between uh, the governments relating to what happened with the American NGOs that, um, that Mohammed Menchawi already already discussed. Then we have had the, 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 the Morsi presidency. There was another attempt on the part of the United States. And this, throughout the period, the constant theme in the United States has been try to have good relations with whoever is in power in Egypt, right? So you, whether it was Mubarak, whether it was the SCAF, whether it was Morsi, whether it is Sisi, maintain the security cooperation, right? But at the same time, other parts of the relationship have become very troubled. And after the, the coup against Morsi, uh, you know, last uh, summer, then of course we have seen for the first time the military relationship between the United States and Egypt come into some question. Um, now, uh, the United States, uh, uh, I think, faces now some difficult choices, and it's trying to learn from its mistakes. Um, I, I think that U.S. policymakers see even now that perhaps they made a mistake during the presidency of Morsi to uh, maintain close cooperation. I don't think they regret cooperating with President Morsi's government. I think maybe they regret a little bit not being clearer about their differences. Uh, with him and appearing to support him uncritically, even while he did some very undemocratic things like the Constitutional Declaration and a constitutional process in which uh, um, was was exclusive in its own way. Now they now they have the same, uh, in a way, a mirror image of the situation now, where you have the military-dominated camp in control, and what does the United States do? I think the United States has been a little bit more critical of uh, undemocratic steps and so forth that this government is taking. But uh, I, I just want to uh, raise one point in which I differ with my colleague, uh, David Pollack, who was talking about interests and values and so forth. From my conversations with U.S. officials, as, and I will speak about Egypt specifically now, I don't think they feel uh, somehow torn by interest versus values. I think it has become something much more practical. They're very, very worried about stability in Egypt. Egypt can only be a good security ally for the United States if it's stable, and they think that Egypt is beyond the point where one can restore an authoritarian type of system with very significant human rights abuses, as we have seen happening in Egypt since last summer, and be stable. So this is, you know, they are, and they are also very worried about economic policies that have been taken uh, up till now, or de decisions on the economy that might be taken by President Sisi now that he is in office. So there, there continues to be a, a problem for the United States. It wants to cooperate militarily with Egypt, but at the same time, it is deeply worried and, and frankly disapproving of the course of events in the country on the level of uh, politics and human rights and economy, and deeply worried that this will lead to uh, instability. So they are trying right now to send this sort of a two-part message. Uh, and we saw this very clearly in, for example, the readout of the telephone call that President Obama had with President Sisi. He congratulated President Sisi on his, on his inauguration. Note that he congratulated him on his inauguration, not on a, a democratic election, because the United States will not really call this a democratic election since there was no actual competition that took place, uh, and said he wants to cooperate on our shared interests. He also said, however, the United States continues to support the aspirations of the Egyptian people and their universal human rights. So they, as you know, much of the military assistance from the United States has been suspended since last summer. It continues to be suspended. 
some of it can, will go forward, can go forward in terms of counterterrorism cooperation, border security, and so forth. But uh, I think as of now, the major military deliveries of F-16s, of tanks, even of Apache helicopters, remain suspended. Uh, look, the United States is in, is in a dilemma. You know, how does it um, influence, you know, the leaders of Egypt to go in a direction in which, uh, which the United States believes is necessary, not just for principle, for the country to become stable. Uh, and to move away from, you know, one political crisis, economic crisis, very bad human rights abuses after another. I think that is really more of the question. And they have been, as I said, had a, I think U.S. officials would like to reshape this relationship with Egypt. I think they would like to reshape the defense relationship uh, in, in a different way, even to spend the money that is given to Egypt on defense in different ways, not on these heavy arms purchases. I I think they would like to change somewhat at least the balance between security assistance and economic assistance. Uh, but but there, is, there are many entrenched interests built here and uh, frankly it is often very, very difficult in the United States as we say to sort of turn the ship of state. You know, we have this very large ship of the Egyptian uh, U.S. relationship going in one direction for for almost 40 years, and to turn it is not something that uh, is done easily. But um, in a way, the suspension of parts, not all, but parts of U.S. military assistance since last summer affords the chance to take another look at this. Uh, I think U.S officials want to do that. They would like to do it in cooperation with Egyptian officials rather than doing it unilaterally, if at all possible. Uh, thank you for respecting the time limit. Uh, now we move to another uh, angle altogether how the youth of Egypt uh, um, started viewing differently the position of the United States and we have Ms. Najwan Al-Ashwal uh, she is preparing for her PhD in, in Italy on the Islamists and Islamic movements and uh, she is an activist in, in, in many forms. Good morning. Uh, the paper that I'm going to present to you, I will focus on a certain phase of the uh, revolutionary agitation and the, f the first 18 days I'll pose one important major question and that is why haven't the revolutionaries in those first 18 days raised any slogans against the United States was this a message in itself this is the major question and uh, I try to benefit from three means of collecting data. First of all, through my own participation in meetings in this uh, agitation and revolutionary movements, whether within the revolutionary coalition for the revolutionary youth, like the 6th of April, or the revolutionary socialists or others, and uh, thirdly, some personal interviews which have helped me to understand the background of why they haven't done what they have or what they have done what they have and their thinking, etc., etc. I also try to analyze the interactive uh, way in which these youth movements uh, have done how they interpreted the situation at that time and also what kind of slogans they raised and how they managed to rally support. And this approach helped me a great deal to understand 
why the youth took the position they had taken towards the United States of America. In my opinion, in that period of the agitation, when they tried to analyze what the problem was, they came to the conclusion that there was a despotic regime that ha they had to depose, but the United States was not part of the scene. That's why they did not raise any slogans against America. They, nobody said America was the great Satan and things like that. Secondly, they wanted to know how they can rally support. They raised four words. They said bread, uh, decent living, uh, living with dignity, human rights, etc. And uh, they tried to rally support based on these uh, slogans and only through focusing on internal affairs rather than engaging in any struggle with outside powers. In my analysis of why the youth have taken this attitude, is first of all, the youth movements, and in that period, they had uh, their priorities were internal and not external. They saw that the ruling regime in Egypt was the problem and not the United States. And in that period, all the statements that came out were in response to accusations by the regime. The regime used to say that these youth are stooges of America, this revolution is made in America, and they get support from America. But any mention of the United States by the youth was not directed at the United States of America, but at the regime, Mubarak regime, to explain their position trying to clarify that the United States had nothing to do with this. They are patriotic youth, they nationalists, they want to change the, the ruling regime uh, away from an intervention by the United States of America. And at that time, even the American statements was that the Egyptian government is a stable one and not otherwise. So therefore, the youth said the internal considerations are more important. The other point is the youth said that they've been following with interest statements coming out of the United States, and they realized that uh, Sami Anan was there, was a military leader, and there were meetings being held with American officials, and these meetings may result in some sort of an understanding on the future, but the youth did not care much about what the United States was doing at that time and their relations with the military elite in Egypt, but they realized there must have been some sort of an understanding between the two. But they still thought that what is internal is more important and the internal factors will create the change and not any outside intervention. If there is any intervention by the outside, can only be to manage the relationship between internal forces like the SCAF and the Muslim Brotherhood or the Allah. The other point in my analysis, I discovered that the youth were aware that the United States has interests in the region and in Egypt. Many interests, but three major ones. The first, of course, the Camp David Accords and the security of Israel. And this is a given, everybody knows that. Secondly, to keep the Suez Canal open and uh, 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 this is why the SCAF insisted during the revolution that the Suez Canal will never be closed or something and to send messages of reassurance to the Americans. Thirdly, uh, the security and intelligence uh, relations between Egypt and the United States. The youth understood that the states has its, its interests and it will try to protect it, but uh, 
any attempt to keep or maintain these uh, relations will depend on, in, on internal uh, factors in Egypt and not uh, outside. And uh, any outside intervention will never materialize th except through some internal for the United uh, some believe that the United States are uh, uh, stand by Israel and do not care about the Palestinian Palestinians' rights and has a very bad history in Iraq and Afghanistan. However, they do not see that during this youth uh, revolution. This should not be raised. Uh, this is not part of the U.S. agenda. However, they believe that uh, internal policy and internal issues take precedence and take priority, and that any U.S. policy is conducted through cooperation with the internal stakeholders. Three main issues that I wanted to focus on so I can understand the youth stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. First, U.S. assistance. Here I found that the youth realized that U.S. assistance, uh, whether military or economic, is first and foremost used for the continuity and survival of Mubarak's regime that uh, helps achieve the U.S. Uh, interests in the region and that the question that we have to uh, that has to be asked, how do military elites use this military assistance that no one knows about internally, and how do the, U the Egyptian establishment, how does it use this assistance? Is it um, uh, channeled to the people or channeled to certain interests of that establishment elite? And here I have a question to the internal environment. Yes, the U.S. interest does have have a lot of, uh, uh, or uh, the United States has a lot of interest, but it is up to the corrupt uh, Egyptian establishment to help achieve it. After some interviews with the youth, I found some very important points and issues to be raised. When I asked the youth, why don't you see that uh, Stepping away from the United States will achieve uh, independence. They asked me, what do we mean by national independence? Do we mean by that what General Sisi has uh, done, i.e. going to Russia to prove that he has pulled himself away from the United States? Or does um, national independence truly mean internal projects and programs that the youth is doing uh, willingly and entering into cooperation and healthy relationships? with Russia and other superpowers, not a relationship of uh, following and uh, achieving that superpower's interest. They consider that national independence uh, is only a mere slogan used by the regime to paint an internal image to the people that this is the regime that seeks independence. This is the regime that uh, uh, will achieve national independence. So this is not a true value. This is not a true cause heralded by the regime itself. Also, the issue of funding uh, NGOs, we found that at the end of the day, the United States has dispensed large amounts of money to serve its own interests and has invested in certain organizations, even though the staff and personnel of those NGOs were not the real reason and instigators of this uh, youth movement, youth revolution. It is clear that the United States has a lot of interests. It is a capital. Uh, or it uh, champions capitalism, it has a lot of values. Some believe that it has wasted its money just to prove to its own people that it has values, while it doesn't truly champion these values practically. 
There were some clear statements from the 6th April young people saying, why don't we put an end to this assistance and aid to the NGOs, to the civil society organization? Why don't we stop all types of assistance if this assistance doesn't truly achieve national Egyptian interests? We have three questions here. First, to what extent do these grants and aid create uh, a so, uh, civil society that truly really works for the interests of Egyptians? The second question, to what extent does this aid and assistance help create uh, uh, a very specific elite that has um, that only serves the interests of the United States? And third, to what extent has this aid helped strengthen the military or has it only created an elite that has in its grip the political landscape as a whole? One more minute, please. The last point is the United States uh, is not the political uh, establishment. This has clarified to the youth that when dealing with the United States, we are not only dealing with the administration itself. We have to distinguish between the administration and the American civil society. And in the civil society, we have to distinguish between organizations and agencies that are truly coherent or whose work is coherent with their values and uh, mission, while there are also organizations that only serve the U.S. interests. I have three last uh, points to make. I found that the youth vision and stance towards the U.S. doesn't have to be black or white. They, they don't have to hate or love the United States. The, the issue is much more complicated than that. It is based on a much more complex perception of the United States. When we talk about uh, the U.S., do we mean uh, by the U.S. an administration or civil society, uh, think tanks, decision makers? Another point I have noticed has to do with what we've seen yesterday related to the Arabic index. The sample that was uh, studied in this research didn't have a very uh, simplistic vision, love or hate to the U.S. There was a lot of distinctions and nuances within the same perception. I wanted to distinguish or compare, establish a comparison, sorry, between the vision of that sample and that of the youth, and I conclude that there is a great awareness to the role, as to the role of the United States, and this great awareness will highly influence uh, the future of Egypt and the youth of Egypt. Thank you. I would like to know that the 6.30 session will be uh, held tomorrow at 11 a.m. So we will end at 6.30 today. So the U.S. Uh, will talk about the U.S. policy uh, with vis-a-vis uh, oh, -vis, uh, political Islam with Dr. Khalil Anani, who works in the Johns Hopkins uh, University. And in the last few years, he distinguished himself uh, with his research and studies on political Islam and Muslim Brotherhood in particular. He will talk to us about this. You have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Saeed. Uh, Saud, sorry. I extend uh, my thanks also to the Arab Center, and I will show you my presentation uh, uh, with the slides, as you see on the screen. This paper, as you see, is entitled The Islamic Policy Vis-a-vis -vis Islamists after the Arab Spring with focusing on, with a focus sorry, on Muslim Brotherhood. It is based on two main theories. The first one says that the fall of uh, oppressive regime was a surprise or a shock to the U.S. and dealing with the Islamists doesn't uh, uh, is different. 
than uh, dealing with the Muslim Brotherhood before the fall of these regimes. So the fall of Mubarak was like an alarm as to uh, for the U.S. to prepare itself for other such examples. The second theory says that uh, the U.S. acceptance to deal with Islamists uh, didn't come uh, willingly. They had to accept that. They had to adapt to the situation while trying to uh, exert damage control as much as possible. We have three main arguments. The first one, the U.S. has followed a very cautious policy when it comes to the rise of Islamists to power in Egypt and uh, try to establish a balance. The second issue, while dealing with this new situation, the U.S. was trying to pursue its relationships with the former regime establishment. Uh, we're talking about intelligence, army, security apparatuses, etc. So it didn't truly really, uh, cut off the cordon or the relations with these uh, people who were still playing a pivotal role, but from behind the scene. The third issue, uh, the U.S. stance towards Islamists shouldn't be considered as a democracy or a democratic approach. It was a more of a pragmatic, realistic approach. Our assessment of the U.S. stance vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Islamists has to be taken from this dimension, the pragmatic dimension, and not the support for democracy dimension. To understand the U.S. Uh, policy towards Islamists requires a trip down memory lane to see how it viewed Islamists in the last three decades. We have three different faces. The first one, as we all know, a use or indirect uh, dealing with the Islamists. And here I talk, I am not talking about our uh, uh, we are not talking about a homogenous uh, structure. We have a lot of conflict uh, uh, inside the United States, the Congress, the Pentagon, the, the State Secretary, the intelligence apparatuses, and the media institutions as well. Uh, here, however, I will only speak about the official stance related to the decision makers in the United States, political decision makers. So the first um, phase was indirect dealing in Afghanistan, for example, there was a, an indirect uh, 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 sponsorship to contain uh, the Soviet or communist threat in the Cold War. The second phase has to do with a phase of dubiousness, of a lot of doubts and fears and concerns uh, after the Algeria events, uh, when the Islamists came to power. And there's a very famous statement here that became a trademark in dealing with the Islamists. When Edward uh, Dregen said, one man, one vote, one time. This statement um, reflected the official American position uh, whereby the arrival of Islamists to power may be a threat, a menace to the U.S. interests. There is a true problem with Islamists uh, for the United States when it comes to freedoms, uh, uh, minorities' rights, and human rights. And we've seen a lot of uh, literature on clash of civilizations. The last phase is the post-9-11. <laughs> What is clear is that there was a lot of, uh, it was a transition towards hostility, towards uh, a clash and confrontation. And the very famous question, why do they hate us? Of course, this was mainly addressed to the Islamic world, including Islamist uh, movements. There was no difference between, for the Americans at least, uh, between moderate and uh, moderate and extremists. Of course, this reflected the American ignorance as to the main variances of uh, political Islam. Here we talk about two main movements. We have a movement that tries to contain, tries to engulf uh, or rather embrace the vision 
that um, we have to open up to moderate Islam. So I talk about Nathan Brown, Mark Lynch, Raymond Baker, and a lot of authors who called for dealing with those uh, moderate Islamists as an authentic part of those societies. The second uh, movement is more confrontational. It deems that the only way to deal with those uh, movements is uh, to confront them, i.e. a uh, clash approach. We talk about Samuel Huntington. Daniel Pives, and a lot of statements by most neoconservatives, such as Mitt Romney. Now, for the practical reality, the practical conclusion, there was a tactical cooperation at times between the U.S. and some Islamist factions. We have the Islamist party in Iraq, and we have sporadically seen um, a dealing with the 2006 National Salvation Front in Syria. The beginning of dealing with the Muslim Brotherhood, the second conclusion is that there was never a true dialogue between uh, uh, Islamists and American, uh, Americans, the American administration. This was only temporary. The U.S. stands vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim Brotherhood after the 25th of Jan uh, revolution. The official U.S. position, as mentioned, included uh, 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 fragmentation into two parts. We have the practical, political, or political pragmatism movement that spoke about the orderly transition that ensures the stay of Mubarak while including uh, political reforms or the arrival of a new governor or president by Omar, uh, that is Omar Taleman or anyone from the former regime. The Americans said that uh, Egypt should not be abandoned, it could be a great gap, and it could propel a new uh, anti-American force into power. So the Americans, or this movement, wanted to manage the transition as best as it could be. The second movement was more of a romantic or idealistic movement adopted by Obama and his administration staff, his advisors. Uh, this is a moment of change, and we should not stand on the wrong side of history. We are witnessing a period of transition, a period of huge changes in the uh, region. We have to get rid or help get rid of those autocratic and useless regimes. Generally speaking, cautiousness, reluctance, hesitance was the rule in dealing uh, with the Islamists. The first gathering between an American and an Islamist from the Muslim Brotherhood happened 10 months after uh, the revolution, uh, with John Kerry, that is. He met some Muslim Brotherhood officials, uh, publicly, of course, and then meetings followed. Uh, Jeffrey Feltman conducted some of uh, those meetings, as well as William Burns. Here, some spoke about a strategic shift from a period of doubts and concerns to the beginning of uh, a relationship of trust between the two parties, with some indicators that the United States is going to embrace the Muslim Brotherhood, or at least accept it. Here also there are two levels. We have the White House dealings, we have the Congress dealings. There were some uh, very uh, angry reactions from the Congress when it comes to uh, opening up to the Muslim Brotherhood. Mark Kirk uh, uh, from the state of Illinois said that uh, Washington should pull out all the stops to prevent the Muslim Brotherhood from getting into power. So the U.S. stance itself was not homogeneous. It wasn't consolidated. It wasn't united. Some uh, called for opening up to the Muslim Brotherhood. Some called for stepping away from them. We have the IPAC think tank and other think tanks. So we're trying to uh, spread a lot of um, warnings about opening up to the Muslim Brotherhood. Following the 2012 presidential elections, Obama found itself uh, having to recognize the legitimacy of the Egyptian elections. 
The first contact between him and Morsi came a few hours after the result was uh, announced. Unlike uh, his call to Sisi that came 97 hours after Sisi was elected, this shows that Obama did recognize the legitimacy of Morsi's election, and uh, he wanted to build on this momentum that he considered as the first step towards a democratic shift in Egypt or a political shift. So there was a sort of uh, relief that came after a lot of tests, a lot of trials when the United States wanted to uh, assess to what extent the Muslim Brotherhood can uh, protect and preserve the U.S. interests in Egypt as well as the respect of freedom and human rights. Three weeks after Morsi came to power, Hillary Clinton visited him. And here a legend started whereby the U.S. supports the Muslim Brotherhood. So this myth was amplified until Mursi was toppled. People were saying that the Muslim Brotherhood came to power, of course, with the support of Obama. This was a legend that was uh, 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 promoted, actually. Uh, a lot of people wanted to know what is Mursi's stance towards Israel. What is the true relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas? Uh, one of the speakers spoke about a, a, a shift, Morsi's uh, um, role as a mediator in reaching a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. And this was an indicator to the U.S. administration that Morsi is someone reliable you can do business with. There was a sort of relief the next day. I don't know if this is a coincidence, but Morsi issued a, um, uh, constitutional amendments that were very harsh, and uh, granting himself uh, absolute powers. This created an internal and an external conflict. Here, the U.S. had to back away from supporting him because he was sending some non-democratic indicators and signals. Therefore, he should be pressured. The political crisis happened in Egypt. And um, a campaign was launched against the United States because they weren't truly condemning Morsi's uh, actions. There was a very confused U.S. stance uh, or position from what happened. They didn't call what happened uh, a coup, but they acted as if it was a coup. John McCain and Lindsey uh, Graham visited Egypt. They spoke about uh, uh, the So they spoke about the dock and walking like a dock. So uh, the Emirates, uh, the KSA, and Israel played a very important role in pressuring the United States to pull away from backing Egypt. After the Nahda and Rabi'a al adawiya killings or massacres, there was a lot of confusion in the American position. And the rhetoric uh, shifted towards suspending the assistance. John Kerry spoke about uh, reducing military assistance or increasing the military assistance, which gave uh, the green light to the military in Egypt to continue oppressing the Muslim Brotherhood. Five main conclusions. The first conclusion, as I've mentioned, there was no clear uh, U.S. policy towards the Islamists. This is also part of the ambiguous U.S. policy towards the Arab Spring. Second, it was clear that the Obama administration is trying not to in, uh, get involved in building strong relations with the uh, Islamists. 
The U.S. realized that there is a, sh a rapid shift in the Egyptian policy, and therefore they had to wait before taking a clear position. It didn't also want to anger a lot of the regional powers. The third issue, there was a, a gradual shift in the U.S. position towards the Muslim Brotherhood in the last three months. After uh, a few months of backing and welcoming and cautiousness, they took a more, more of a reactive approach, and then they caved in into the regional pressure. And currently, the uh, administration doesn't truly really feel that there is a need to pressure the previous regime in, uh, or the Egyptian authorities in order to integrate the Muslim Brotherhood, as long as its relationship with the military establishment and intelligence apparatuses in Egypt is good, especially after the election of Sisi two weeks ago. The U.S. recognizes the political process without fully supporting it. We have to wait before we truly assess this position. Thank you. When he steps away from the table, uh, he, he forgets that he has a specific time to abide by. We have with us uh, Mr. Anwar Jamaawi, who is a researcher. Uh, now we have Mr. Anwar Jamaawi, who lectures at Susa University in Tunisia, and uh, he is a specialist in the comparative uh, religion, and he has many articles about political Islam. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I would like to thank the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies for uh, organizing this event. Uh, I have a paper on, on the position of the United States regarding the Islamists ruling Tunisia. I'll start by trying to answer some questions on the nature of the relations between America and the political Islam before the revolution, after the revolution, and the brief period in which that Al-Nahda ruled Tunisia and the way they managed the affairs of the country, and then when willingly they decided to relinquish their power, and uh, this is part and parcel, of course, of the general study of uh, Islamists and their relationship with the others, and specifically the United States. Historically, in trying to understand our uh, the relationship between the United States and Islamists, that can be divided into two stages, the pre- and post-revolution. Before the revolution, there was periods of contact and periods of disengagement, and the Nahda movement uh, sometimes, well, because of uh, the way the Bourguiba clamped down on it and also in the, right during the reign of Zain al-Abidin bin Ali. The American administration's position in that period did not seem to be paying that much attention to the Islamists' uh, criticisms of the way he treated them and others, and the, the Americans used to seem to have accepted Bourguiba's uh, argument that he was uh, the pioneer of modernization in Egypt and uh, uh, also uh, by his successor, Ben Ali, who presented himself 
as um, a shield against extremists and Islamists, uh, particular in Algeria and other countries. But uh, in around 2006, we noticed a difference in the way the administration dealt with the Islamists. And this, of course, was one of the WikiLeaks uh, leaks uh, when a number of Al-Nahda's uh, leaders were released from prison and the administration seemed a little bit more willing to to initiate contact with them. The Islamist leaders initiated this contact, in fact, at the, at the American embassy uh, arranged some meetings with the leadership of another, like Ziyad Dulatli, and it seems that the administration uh, formed an impression that these are moderates and they are able to create a civil state. Uh, and uh, Ziad Dulatli attracts the American embassy by saying that uh, it's in the interest of all of us to find an alternative to bin Ladenism, as he called it, or extremism. And uh, another meeting was held with Hamad Jbali and the counselor of the embassy, and he explained to the counselor Jbali that is that they are not in business to impose Sharia rule. Uh, after the revolution, we saw more contact with the Islamists and the American administration. The United States seemed to be uh, understanding the reasons why the protest movement started in Tunis. They, in fact, called on Bin Ali to be more flexible and uh, in his response to the demands of the protesters and the administration did, did not seem to object that uh, Islamists can reach power and this is Victoria Noland and John McCain have said at the time who said that uh, Judging Islamists can only be done through the way they deal with issues like democracy, tolerance, human rights, etc. This uh, approach uh, developed gradually when the administration uh, congratulated the Tunisians after the elections in 2011, and the President Obama congratulated the Tunisians for their first uh, successful proper elections. And he congratulated Hamad Jbali, who is the leader of Al Nahda, when he became prime minister, uh, heading a coalition government which had Islamists and secularists in its uh, uh, rank and file. Also, uh, the calls to isolate Al Nahda did not meet uh, much approval and heeding in the administration when the decision makers and the think tanks seem to be in favor of reaching out to this Islamic movement, which has always been moderate and accepted the principle of uh, peaceful uh, elections and uh, power sharing and uh, <coughs> Stephen McKinley, the executive director of democracy in the Middle East, uh, did not agree 
with those who called to us late and Nahda, he argued by saying that this and now there's not Hamas, and now there's not Hezbollah, they do not have a military wing. It's one Islamic movement which accepts human rights, respects women's rights, and he said 47% of the members of the Constituent Assembly are women, members of an nahda that is. In return, an nahda has also uh, taken many strides uh, on the road to democracy. They, they had uh, a manifesto, a political program with over 300 uh, points in which they did not call for the implementation of Sharia, nor did they call for uh, establishing an Islamic state or a caliphate. Uh, and uh, also Al-Nahda tried to, to build bridges with civil society organizations, trade unions, and the constitution, the draft constitution, constitution was indicative of the fact that uh, uh, the aim was to have uh, one comprehensive, uh, comprehensive constitution written by all parties and not just the Islamists. And this uh, met with uh, a positive response by the administration, which uh, blessed this kind of uh, positive change. And Nahda proved to be very flexible through accepting principles like, uh, for example, not uh, criminalizing blasphemy me and uh, also accepting the principle of gender equality and also they, they also they did not uh, accept uh, the, any new legislation banning previous regime figures from occupying public positions. But all of this does not uh, mean to say that the administration did not express uh, inconvenience of uh, the Al-Nahda an trying to engage in dialogue and contain the Salafists, but uh, it seems that by and large the Salafist uh, in Tunisia was more inclined towards violence, which constituted a threat to the new fledgling uh, uh, democracy. And when they assassinated the two political leaders and uh, attacked the American embassy, all of this caused a problem between the ruling Troika and the American administration, which uh, saw in, in Al Nahda the inability to deal with the threats to security. All of this, and together, these uh, factors did not. Uh, stop the administration from evacuating some members of the embassy. And also, on the other hand, the, the administration had somewhat positive engagement with the trade unions and uh, in conclusion we can say that uh, the United States uh, has chosen to reach out and build bridges of dialogue with al -Nahda, and al -Nahda on its part has accepted to relinquish power in response to the protest movement and in acknowledgement that uh, legitimacy comes from consensus first, not just uh, elections. So they 
relinquished power and uh, accepted a new technocrat government to come to power to prepare for uh, election. David Pollock considered that as a precedent in the history of Islamic movements, uh, despite the popularity enjoyed by al nahda they did not uh, uh, try to remain in power and they relinquished it when faced with the protests. So we can say that uh, the, there's always the fear that uh, the popularity of uh, Islamists on one hand and the trend towards extremism also at the latter days of Bin Ali and, uh, and this caused some tension in the past but uh, in 2011 the, this was a turning point in the relations between the Islamists and the American administration which seemed more willing to listen to the will of uh, people and not just uh, relying on reports uh, by the intelligence, intelligence services of despotic uh, allied regimes and also the way Al-Nahda dealt with questions and accepted the coalitions with the secular powers was a welcome sign, although the administration was not happy with the way that government handled security issues, so we can say and Nahda was not successful in uh, overcoming uh, serious economic uh, and security challenges, but in the end, they did not uh, choose to stick to power at a time when there was there, there was a protest against it, and this is like what Azmi Bashar described as the post-Muslim Brotherhood era, and the Al-Nahda sent some positive signals, and at the same time, when a moderate Islamist movement comes to power, does not on its own establish uh, an Arab Spring. We need uh, the entire societies to be more aware of their rights and their practices, as well as outside help and support. Otherwise, the failure of the project of reform will only mean a return of extremism. And Nahda has developed some positive positions. This leaves the question open whether or not other Islamic movements will do the same or not. Thank you for your kind attention. In the time remaining, we will have some interventions. Please do not take too long. Uh, we start with Mr. Abdul Wahab. He was waiting from last session. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, I cannot comment uh, on all of the papers and presentations, but I have two comments. This uh, and uh, I attended uh, a meeting at the Foreign Relations Council some 20 years ago which discussed the American policy towards uh, Islamists at that time. Before the meeting, one of the organizers uh, met with me and said to me, this is an academic discussion in the bad sense because we will not have any effect uh, and impact for one simple reason when President Clinton visits the Israeli Prime Minister or Saudi King or Jordanian King, the Egyptian President, they all have one message 
that the Islamists are a threat and you should not deal with them. So therefore the policy is made and there is no more room for any discussion about it. And this leads me to my second point. Uh, it's very rarely that Arabs can manage to have any impact on American foreign policy, especially when they are in agreement with Israel. And I don't want this event to turn into an academic one in the bad sense. I think the problem in the American foreign policy is that uh, no one will come uh, to the White House, I hope I'm wrong, that we'll find uh, no president who will be more uh, supportive or uh, to, Ar to Ar Arab causes. And I therefore say we as Arabs have lost the, uh, the opportunity. The Arabs can, if they want to, in uh, impacting the, um, the American foreign policy. But even if we appoint an Arab to be the president occupying the White House, what can he do? He will need from the Arabs themselves to move first and do something and uh, pressurize Israel and do something. But if the Arabs themselves are not capable of doing anything, what can any American president do? Good afternoon. My name is Mahmoud Ibrahim. I work for uh, election campaigns in Egypt. Uh, Mrs. Nagwan said that when she talked about youth, I'm a bit sensitive. Uh, please, uh, uh, can you elaborate a little bit? You said you dealt with, with some movements like the 6th of April and others who appeared during the revolution because are they just a creation of media and propaganda, or do they have real presence on the ground? And you said also that the United States was not part of the scene, yes, but it was playing a role in the background and behind the scenes. And also, I want to know how many NGOs were financed by the United States, for, for example, and this kind of uh, finances, how was it done? We have to understand these things because the United States, uh, from 2005 till 2011, were playing an indirect role behind the scenes. And also, uh, it was part of the scene too. Wael uh, Ghunayim, for example, was arrested, uh, a member of the uh, American, uh, American intelligence, intelligence services. That's why he was arrested. Dr. Khalil also, America, American policy is a failure everywhere in the, in the world, Syria, Ukraine, everywhere. But uh, before January, there was track two, when uh, you, you, you said that the Americans never met uh, the Brotherhood's MPs. I say to you, they did meet, maybe not officially. Uh, they, they met not maybe by the Assistant Secretary of State, but they were met by ambassadors. And uh, you said the Saudis uh, helped the regime in Egypt. What about Turkey's support of the Brotherhood? Finally, uh, I spoke to an official before the 30th of June about a green light the 
army getting any support. He told me that the Americans are not with us. This is what we will do whether they like it or not. I said to him, the Americans will not accept it. He said, so what? Omar Zbedi from Sir Center. There is, since we started this conference, there is this general uh, concept of American Americans. We don't know who do you mean by that. Uh, the, this is a simplification because the Obama's administration's policy is different than that of the CIA. The State Department. Uh, for example, can have differing views than that of the Pentagon, whether over Syria or not. There was even a conflict between the Congress and the administration when it comes to contacts with Iran. This generalization, when we keep saying American policy or America, American policy is uh, a collection of uh, policies. What is uh, implemented outside the country is different to that inside the country, and it's always sold to the people through the perspective of uh, interest and doing good, etc. The administration, do you have a question, or is this just a comment? The administration is not a charity. What matters to America is the American national interest. Muslim Brotherhood or any other group is, is part of many uh, forces that America can deal with. And whoever provides America with his interest, the Americans will deal with. We have to uh, wrap up because we're running out of time. Izzat al Nimri, an Egyptian uh, writer. There are some facts that we cannot uh, be oblivious to, mainly in Egypt. If there are some regional powers, whether they are emerging powers that do not read or uh, ancient powers that want to achieve their own interests, we have to understand what is going on. The movement in, Masr, in Egypt sorry, right now is uh, very clear to everyone, and I think it's going to escalate. Let us please abide by the topics we have raised in this uh, session. Please have very specific questions to our speakers. So I think the movement in Egypt is going to escalate. The abstention from taking part in the elections has a huge significance. We have to understand the mistakes that are being committed by the Egyptian establishment today. We also have to note the violations of human rights, of women's rights. The question is, would the United States continue to deal with the situation as it did during those 18 days, or will it change its approach, especially that the youth movement and the revolutionary movement right now is well aware of what should be done? The perception of, uh, by the youth of the U.S. stance is something very important. Uh, the youth always saw and considered that the United States is standing on the side and therefore it is not taking a... a playing a major role, nor is it helping with the regime change. We know that the revolutionary spirit during those 18 days was very strong, the momentum was very high. However, when we move to speaking about strategies and interests, I believe that the United States has to link its economic uh, position, or its economic ties uh, with Egypt, 
not with the security position and the protection of Israel, but rather it has to rely on the respect of human rights by the Egyptian regime. Otherwise, in five years' time, we, will, uh, we have to expect another youth revolution against the regime. So you can only imagine what the youth will think of any ally to this authoritarian regime. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, and therefore we have to end the session because uh, after, of course, giving the floor to the speakers, because unfortunately we have to move to the next session. Okay, I'll just comment on a few of the points that have been made um, regarding um, uh, our, our colleague here was speaking about too much generalization in the way we're discussing, you know, America, and there are all these different players and so forth. I mean, that is that is certainly true, um, uh, and and we could talk about those things for quite a while. I mean, I I think that. It, there are a lot of differences. There are differences inside the administration, for example, regarding policy toward Egypt uh, and between, and then different members of Congress. I mean, when I spoke of it in general, it was just these are the these are the decisions that are emerging <laughs> that are actually being implemented. You know, to kind of simplify things. But you are right that it is. Um, you know, there there is a lot. There are a lot of differences uh, regarding the. Um, role of the regional parties, and especially the Gulf states uh, regarding Egypt. This was something I didn't say during my presentation, but I think it's very important. I think that one of the failings regarding uh, American policy in the region uh, toward the countries that have had revolutions like Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, etc., has been a failure to engage effectively with the Gulf states. The United States has had long-term uh, relationships with all of the Gulf states, and uh, I think it was a, uh, a failure on the part of the United States to have strategic discussions with these countries. That's not to say the United States and these countries would uh, agree on everything. As we know, the the attitude towards the United, uh, towards, for example, the desirability of democracies being born in this region, the American attitude and the Saudi attitude would be quite different, you know. But in the past, the United States had the habit of always having strategic discussions with these partners in an attempt to minimize differences so that we would not be working against each other's interests and so forth. And I think we have seen a, a failure of American leadership in that regard. It's most obvious regarding Syria, but it is it, it still has played itself out in, in Egypt, in um, Tunisia and Libya and so forth. So this is something that the United States has just started to do a little bit more recently with President Obama's visit to Saudi Arabia and Secretary Hagel's visits to the Gulf and so forth. But it is, uh, I think it's something that has ended up causing a problem for the United States to have some of its other allies in the region directly contradicting and working against U.S. policy, specifically regarding Egypt. Um, and the, the question of, you know, will the United States learn its lessons from the past and so forth, I, I do think that most of the American officials with whom I meet believe there is a serious process of change underway in this region and in a place like Egypt. They really, they they don't know, uh, you know, I think they've been really startled by a lot of the things that have happened uh, and they don't, uh, they don't believe necessarily that they, uh, that they know exactly what the peoples in these countries want or that what, what officials tell them that, you know, because frankly, you know, Morsi told them the Egyptian people are with me. I have the proof from the elections. They support my agenda and therefore you should support my agenda. And now we see the same thing with CC and with the military. The Egyptian people are with me. I have the numbers. Look at those people in the streets in Tahrir. And, it, and I think US officials at this point say, we don't know. I mean, we're not. We're not. You know. I mean, we'll, we're 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 watching this thing, and we're trying to find something to guide our policies toward toward Egypt. But they do believe that these countries are in in profound change, and that things are not simply going to go back the way they were before 2011. 
Thank you. I will answer uh, Mr. Mahmoud Ibrahim's questions. Uh, he had a question about a meeting between uh, Muslim Brotherhood officials and Congress officials. It did happen, and everybody recognized that. I couldn't delve into the details uh, for the lack of time. The Muslim Brotherhood will remain the strongest movement in Egypt. There was a, an American realization that any ties, non-official ties with the Muslim Brotherhood will be used by the Mubarak regime. When it comes to the Turkish role and its uh, comparison between this and the Saudi and Iranian role, there is no comparison. Uh, the Turkish role is based on uh, practical approaches, Erdogan uh, supporting a lot of Islamic movements. There might be huge differences between uh, uh, secularism and a Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, Muslim Brotherhood rejects secularism. Turkey didn't go to the Congress, didn't go to the U.S. administration, didn't dispense $12 million to Morsi. So the Turkish support is not to be compared at all with the Gulf support of the situation after June the 3rd. A third issue has to do with the relationship between the U.S. and the military. You said that you met an official. He said they do what they want. This is not true. And I will give you two examples. Abdel Fattah Hassisi, in his first interview with the New York Times after the coup, he was complaining that uh, President Obama didn't uh, call him. He almost cried because of it. So he was uh, resentful as to why he is not given the importance he merits. He also spoke to Reuters and said, we need the U.S. support. We have to receive uh, assistance to counter terrorism. So any rhetoric about a military struggle against the United States, I, I think this is only mythical. This is a mere legend. The U.S. administration, as I've mentioned, is not a homog uh, homogeneous or um, cohesive ensemble. So I think we shouldn't just generalize when we say the U.S. administration. Thank you for your questions. I have three academic questions and a, a question for the media. For Wael Hone, I think anything that has to do with Wael Hone uh, is more of a media say. I was clear in my paper when I said that I will talk about uh, youth groups who motivated the, the revolution in the first phase, and I also spoke about the coalition of revolution youth including the April 6th uh, movement. The definition I adopt in this paper is the one adopted by recognized uh, movements that we cannot turn a blind eye to. These are the movements that truly really motivated and were the engine behind the revolution. A question related to the U.S. presence behind uh, the scenes. I agree with what Mr. Mohamed Abbas has mentioned, whereby the youth perceive the movement in Egypt as a social movement with no U.S. intervention, and all of our colleagues truly and honestly and clearly stated that the United States was truly shocked and surprised with the events unfolding in Egypt. It had no idea what is going on. There is also so an analytical report published in the New York Times stating that the U.S. estimates prior 
to the Egyptians pray revealed that there's only a 20% chance of the regime being toppled. So even the intelligence agencies could not foresee the developments in Egypt. Therefore, this revolution is a true national revolution. Another question on the financing of civil society activities. I was clear when I said that the youth were asking legitimately, of course, if the assistance provided by the U.S. to CSOs truly uh, contributes to the development of society. And here I remind those who forgot the April 6 movement after a report was published to prove its innocence from receiving any financing from U.S. Uh, said through Ahmad Maher that uh, you should prohibit any uh, foreign financing and uh, military backing and assistance. NGOs were, were made up of the movements inside uh, the Cairo University and Ain Shams University. Those movements include uh, socialists, 6 April movements, Islamists, and other movements with a whole other idea and perception from uh, those of the military ruling elite and also U.S. ruling uh, officials. The last idea has to do with generalization. I agree with the one saying that we cannot generalize when we speak about the U.S. administration. This shows in the youth and the conclusions of the Arabic index. There was a distinction between the youth itself, between CSOs and non-CSO related movements. Some people perceive that uh, the U.S. made a distinction between uh, what foreign agencies are doing uh, and other agencies are doing. I believe, in conclusion, that there is a highly significant awareness amongst the youth, across the youth landscape. These youth have a revolutionary mindset and amongst the people themselves, who are those people we are talking about? Are they the majority who did not go to vote uh, in the presidential elections in Egypt? Or do you mean other people that you are trying to highlight through your own media outlets? Thank you. We are through with this session. Uh, there will be another session. May God guide your efforts. Thank you.